Hi, I'm Joaquin Seguroa. I'm the Clinical Chief of Cardiology at OHSU, and I'm pleased to describe uh, today for you uh, aspects of how we approach uh, performing procedures on individuals with suspected heart disease, either for diagnostic purposes, and that is to establish do you or do you not have coronary disease, and as well as a therapeutic uh, procedure and that is we're able to do procedures such as angioplasties and or stents to unblock heart arteries and more recently we are able to uh, do what we call structural heart procedures where individuals who are born with congenital heart defects can have holes closed, individuals with leaky heart valves can have them repaired, and individuals with narrowed heart valves can now have them replaced in certain cases with catheter-based approaches. Interestingly, a lot of this uh, was actually developed at OHSU uh, in the period of the late 1950s and 1960s. And in fact, the concept of angioplasty was developed by a radiologist by the name of uh, Dr. Daughter uh, here at OHSU. So the first uh, angioplasty was done in a femoral artery here at OHSU. And in fact, the catheters that we utilize still today to make it easier and to make it safer to do heart catheterizations were developed by one of our radiologists. So who needs an angiogram and how do we go about doing an angiogram? Individuals who have symptoms of heart disease uh, in individuals, it's often classically described as a heaviness or a tightness or a pressure, or individuals who have abnormal stress tests that suggest that there may be narrowings, should have a discussion with their physician and should often meet with a cardiologist to discuss whether it would be appropriate or not to have an angiogram. There are many terms that are used to describe angiograms. Uh, individuals use the term cardiac catheterization or heart catheterization, which is encompasses all the different types of procedures that we do here. Uh, coronary angiography refers to specifically taking pictures of the heart arteries. So if in discussion with your physicians, talking about the risks and the benefits of treating individuals where the foundation should always be nutrition, uh, should include certain medicines to reduce the risk of heart attacks in addition to nutrition and exercise, and classically that would be an aspirin, a cholesterol-lowering medicine, uh, and often a class of medicines called beta blockers or nitroglycerin. Um, some of those individuals will require an angiogram, and how do we go about doing that? So um, there is the use of this equipment that you see behind us, and so patients typically will come in and they will lie down on this table. And this table has an x-ray source that's beneath the table and has a detector. And so the x-rays pass through the body and we inject an iodine-based contrast, which then through a catheter that we insert into the heart. And so this is called a Judkins catheter uh, that was designed many years ago by one of our own faculty allows us to inject dye through this catheter and this shape allows us to consistently get into the left coronary artery. So a patient will be lying down here. We'll use a local anesthetic called lidocaine and uh, we will use a small needle and introduce that into typically one of two places. Either the radial artery in the arm or the femoral artery in the groin. And so we'll have a patient lying down here, and we have these screens here, and we have the catheter inserted into the heart artery, and then we'll inject the iodine-based dye, and with this camera we'll develop pictures. And we'll take pictures in multiple projections, and we'll take pictures of the left heart uh, artery, called the left coronary, and then the right coronary. And uh, once we do so, and that typically takes about 30 minutes, uh, we're able to determine uh, and answer the following questions. Do you or do you not have coronary artery disease? If you do have coronary artery disease, should we continue to manage you through nutrition 
and exercise and medications? Or in addition to that, can improving the blood flow with a angioplasty and or stent or open heart surgery improve your quality of life and or reduce your risk of heart attack or death in the future? And we make those decisions with you as a patient in conjunction with what we find on the test interpreted through the results of your stress test and clinical symptoms. And we put all that together and then determine whether or not we should go ahead and put in a stent. And so uh, when we decide to put in a stent, uh, we're pretty successful in doing so in about 99.5% of the time we can proceed safely, successfully without causing any complications and uh, we're able to consistently get good results uh, that decrease the probability of scar tissue forming at the site that we do the work. And uh, for most people, that then means that you can do more exercise without having that so-called angina, the heaviness, tightness, or pressure. Importantly, putting stents in treats that one area but doesn't treat the entire heart artery. And that's really the importance of complementing procedures with medications, with nutrition, and cardiac rehab. So how do we do an angioplasty or stent? We've gone over the findings with you. We've seen where the narrowing or narrowings are. We've determined that you're a candidate for this procedure. And then we have to be able to get our equipment there. So as a guide, we have your uh, heart anatomy up on our screen and we know which vessel and which branch of the vessel the narrowings are in. And so then we have to take a wire and this is an example of that wire. And this wire serves like a, serves like a rail just like for a train to get somewhere it needs to have tracks. So these are the tracks for our balloons and stents. And as you can see this wire is about the thickness of a hair. And we take the end of this wire and we put a series of bends and advance it through this long catheter so that it gets to the heart artery. And then by advancing and having the right bend on the tip of this and gently advancing and twisting, we're able to navigate the roadmap that we have and advance this across the narrowing. So now we have a way of delivering equipment. So once we have that wire across, we can then take a small catheter and this catheter rides that wire to the area of the narrowing. And as you can see, the profile of this balloon is very small and so that you're able to coax this to the point of the narrowing and then we're able to inject using an inflation device, uh, a liquid solution that has dye so that we can see the balloon inflate. And this will inflate to whatever size balloon that we pick. So if it's a three millimeter balloon, it will inflate to three millimeters. And it will push that plaque and redistribute it into the vessel wall and stretch. We'll then be able to take a catheter that has a stent mounted on it and advance it to that point of narrowing and then with the balloon inflating we'll be able to deploy that stent into the narrowing and that stent then serves as a scaffold to keep the vessel open and so I'm going to just show you here in a moment how we inflate this. This whole balloon has a channel that is connected to this device. This device has a fluid with contrast so that as we push the fluid into this balloon we can see that the stent expands into the vessel wall and so we take this device and we begin to inflate and you can see now that the profile is much larger and the balloon is inflated. Once you're happy that the balloon is completely inflated and that the stent is up against the vessel wall, then we deflate the balloon.
And with that balloon deflated, the stent remains open and you pull the balloon back and this is now what a deployed stent would look like held into the vessel wall. Then the next step that we can do is we can insert a catheter that has an ultrasound probe and put it in and look from inside out of the vessel to make sure that each of those metal struts which serve as a scaffold are well positioned into the vessel wall. And so this device really has transformed the predictability of getting good results. You still have to have good techniques and importantly as I mentioned you have to know how long you need to be on that second super aspirin in addition to aspirin to make sure that you improve your chances of doing well. And there are two basic types of stents. There are metal stents and there are metal stents with coatings that decrease scar tissue. Both have advantages and both have disadvantages. And so we utilize both and we choose which one based on patient preferences and what we think the probability is that that patient may develop recurrent scar tissue at the site. As a rule of thumb, drug coated stents less often have scar tissue that requires us doing repeat procedures in the future than metal stents. But the larger the vessel and the shorter the narrowing, the less benefit there is to using a drug coated stent versus a regular stent. And importantly, if you get a drug coated stent, it's very important that you take an aspirin and a second medicine that's a super aspirin for at least one year to decrease the risk of clotting. Whereas with metal stents, you only have to do that for one month. So it becomes very important to know what type of stent did you get and how long should you be on the super aspirin in addition to the aspirin. And so that's a very important point. And so um, stents really have revolutionized our ability to get consistently good results for our patient and, has decreased, and have decreased the probability of recurrent scar tissue forming and have decreased really remarkably the need for emergent open heart surgery during the performance of angioplasty and stents because the results are so consistent. Um, so those are some of the basic things about how we do these procedures, uh, some of the equipment, but it's really interesting in addition to uh, treating, uh, in addition to diagnosing coronary disease, we've also made great advances in diagnosing and treating congenital heart disease, such as holes in certain chambers, um, where we're now able to close those holes with catheter-based uh, devices, uh, whether we're able to close communications between certain chambers that shouldn't be there. And over the course of the last several years, we're now actually able to replace, in certain patients, heart valves without open heart surgery. And that is, we can go through either the femoral artery or in certain cases through the very tip of the heart with making a small incision and mount on a catheter a stent like so. And you can see here that there is a stent and within that stent is a heart valve. And so you can take that heart valve and you can collapse it onto a balloon. Typically that balloon is sturdier than the balloons that we use for angioplasty and heart stents. And you can take that and you can deliver it to where a patient's disease heart valve is. And we can do this for the uh, valve called the pulmonic valve, which is between the right-sided pumping chamber and the lungs, or between the main pumping chamber on the left side of the heart called the left ventricle and the aorta, and that is the aortic valve. And so in both those cases, we can now implant valves without making incisions in the chest wall. Still requires general anesthesia um, for both of these cases, and still requires coming into the hospital. Typically, for the pulmonic valves, we can discharge somebody the next day. And for the aortic valves, typically they're in the hospital for about 
three to five days, um, and then have a much quicker recovery thereafter than traditional open heart surgery. These procedures are not appropriate for every patient. And so, for example, in the aortic narrowings, uh, this procedure is approved by the FDA for patients who are not candidates for open heart surgery or are at extremely high risk of complications of traditional aortic valve surgery. And so we're really, um, really, really fortunate here at OHSU to be able to provide a uh, list of broad capabilities to diagnose and treat coronary disease, to diagnose and treat congenital heart disease, and to diagnose and treat valvular heart disease. And we're really fortunate to have national leaders who um, work with us, uh, who are part of our team, to continue to advance uh, how we treat patients. And we have an illustrious past with individuals here who fundamentally change the capabilities of how patients are treated. And so, as I mentioned, Dr. Judkins, who designed this catheter, um, Dr. Daughter, who developed the concept of angioplasty, uh, and Dr. Starr, who working with Lowell Edwards, designed and implanted the first artificial heart, excuse me, the first artificial valve um, and did so here at OHSU. Um, because at the end of the day, uh, we're here for our patients. We're here to make sure that we provide you outstanding care, that we continue to innovate, and that we teach our future providers uh, for tomorrow to continue to improve the care. It's also important that we work with our patients to understand that this is one part of your treatment strategy. Cardiac rehab is a very important part. And so uh, when you begin to do all the right things, we're able to consistently result in better outcomes for our patients. So we recognize that we are but one link in the delivery of making sure that you have the best chance of being active, healthy, safe, with a better quality of life and a longer quality of life. So uh, I'm happy that you are uh, learning more about how to improve your health and getting some insights into what we do uh, here in our heart catheterization laboratory uh, and that you're also participating in our cardiac rehab program because in order to have the greatest improvement in your quality of life, and quantity of life, participating in cardiac rehab improves those chances and is a critical link to making sure that you know your body and you improve your chances of feeling well and not having a, recur not having a recurrent heart attack or requiring another procedure and improves the chance that you're knowledgeable and continue to be an integral part of the care that you receive.